Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar titled B cell repertoire in determining responses to checkpoint blockade in NSCLC. My name is Carrie Haslam and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Today I'm delighted to be joined with Dr Akshay Patel and Professor Gary Middleton from the University of Birmingham as they explore the mechanisms of immunotherapy. In the webinar, our experts will also help you better understand the burden and incidence of immune related adverse events and they will also review biological mechanisms and current biomarker research. Following the presentation, we will have time for a question and answer session. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit these in the box to the right of your screen. So without further delay, I would like to hand over to our speakers and I would like to thank them again for presenting with us. Please go ahead. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Gary Middleton. I'm Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Birmingham. I'm also a consulting medical oncologist at the University Hospital Birmingham. And joining me today um, was my, my graduate students. It's Akshay Patel. He's now an academic clinical lecturer um, and a, th surgical, a thoracic surgical trainee. And he'll be doing the second half of this talk, really presenting his PhD work, um, which has led to a really important publication for us. I thought I'd kick off really by just really giving you a bit of background to what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to be talking about non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking about B cells in non-small cell lung cancer. So this is really the layout of what we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes. I'm going to give you a little bit about the natural history of the disease, its incidence, its mortality and its importance, really. And then going to go through a bit of data on the uh, biology of the disease and in particular on the clinical trials that have really informed our management of these patients, particularly first line standard anti cancer therapy for these patients. Then I'm going to then hand over to Akshay to really give you a sort of overview of B cell biology, which has become a really very interesting area of research. I think we've got very used to seeing many, many papers about T cells, but not so much about B cells, but it's quite clear that B cells are fundamental in terms of the immunobiology of cancer. Then he's going to present his data where we looked at single cell profiling using cytof of B cell subsets in patients uh, with lung cancer being treated with checkpoint blockade. I'll explain that concept in a second. Then he's going to back that up with some functional data, which is really important in sort of reinforcing the findings that he got from the single cell profiling, and then talk about where we're going to take this work further. So in essence, um, non-small cell lung cancer is a very, very common cancer. There are two main types of lung cancer. There's small cell, so-called because the cells look small, and that makes up about 10% now of all lung cancer and are very strongly associated with smoking. And then there's non-small cell lung cancer. This used to be about 85%, it's probably nearer 90% now. And basically it's split into two main categories. There's non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer and then squamous non-small cell lung cancer. Squamous cancer accounts for about 20 to 25% of cancers, again, very smoking related. Whereas the non-squamous non-small cell lung cancers, that makes up about 75%. And importantly, quite a large number of this now are actually lung cancer in never smokers, people that smoke less than 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. And you might think that's a bit unusual, lung cancer in never smokers, but in fact, it's becoming a very serious health problem indeed. And it represents in some countries, one of the commonest cause of cancer death, a worldwide probably accounts between the seventh and ninth in the list of highest cancers causing death. So lung cancer in never smokers is a real big problem. And we think that the main driver for this is in fact, uh, atmospheric pollution, so particulate matter less than 2.5 microns, we think is promoting mutations that are already present in normal healthy lung tissue. This is work that my colleague Charlie Swanton recently presented at ESMO, a very interesting story in disease, indeed. And as it says here, that non-small cell lung cancer, a common cause of disease, we actually see lung cancer in the UK, for example, it occurs in just under 50,000 people a year, and it accounts for 35,000 deaths per year. It's the second commonest cancer in women, second commonest in men, but by far and away the commonest cause of cancer death and worldwide it's a really massive problem. So here we've just got some uh, Cancer Research UK statistics. These are from five years ago, but they haven't materially changed very much over the last five years. And these are the lung cancer age standardised one, five and 10 year survivorship. A little bit stereotypical here. We have uh, women in uh, pink and uh, males in blue with the purpley colour being both. But you can see that if you just look at the one year survivorship, 
But actually, it's just coming up to 40%, really. So, you know, that means 60% of patients diagnosed are uh, not with us uh, a year. And when you look out at the five-year mark and the 10-year mark, again, as you might expect, these figures go down significantly. So that less than 20% of patients with lung cancer, and this includes patients that can have an operation, for example, can actually, uh, actually alive with us um, for five years. And obviously, this is a disease that remains a, a significant unmet therapeutic need, and we new, need new therapies for it. The next slide, please. And this again shows this a bit more graphically, really. Here you've got the same sort of colour coding here. And this time, this is just looking at the one-year survivorship. And this is now breaking it down by stage. And I'm not going to go through this in any depth because it's just for interest of time. But effectively, stage one disease is where you've got small tumours that have got no lymph gland involvement. Stage two, we're getting larger tumours. Stage three, we're getting lymph gland involvement in the middle of the chest. And stage four, these are patients where the disease has spread. In other words, metastatic patients. Uh, often involving the pleura, the other lung with pulmonary metastases, the brain, the bone, the adrenal glands, or the liver in about 15% of patients. And you can see that with stage one disease, so small node negative tumours, it's pretty good, but there's still sort of 15, 20% of patients aren't with us a year. And that normally means having had surgery as well. But if we look at that stage four, those metastatic patients, it's 20% alive a year. And again, those figures are in desperate need of improvement. These, of course, are all comers. OK, and the, the bottom line is that whilst patients who actually have treatment for lung cancer do quite well, many, many, many of our patients are not fit enough for any treatment. Their performance status is too low and they get no treatment at all. It's just purely best supportive care. And we saw a real upsurge of this during COVID where patients were presenting very late, weren't able to get their GPs, weren't presenting to the hospitals and then coming into A&E very poorly and just not fit enough for any treatment. So that's why that figure is so poor, because we've got so many patients that have no therapy at all. Next slide, please. And as you can imagine, as I've already said, the treatment by stage varies enormously. The stage one disease, where it's early, early disease, where there's no lymph gland involvement, then surgical treatments used in nearly 60% of patients. But by the time you get to just stage 3A disease, this is where you've got lymph gland involvement in the middle of the chest, but no spread. You can see here that it's down to 15%. And the reason so few patients are treated with surgical interventions is because we know that if you've got lymph gland involvement in the middle of the chest, the outcome, even with surgery, is pretty poor. These patients require multi-modality treatment, which we'll briefly talk about in a minute. So the next slide, please. I think it's true to say that the treatment paradigm has completely and utterly changed over the last 10 years. Um, up until 10 years ago, uh, there was a lots of people that were sort of interested in immunology of cancer. So there have been many, many preclinical studies done. People had sort of done many, many cancer immunotherapy trials, mainly using cancer vaccines, and the results had been really, really poor. But about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, the world was completely revolutionised. There was a transformation in the way in which we treat cancer, lung cancer as well. And this was with immunotherapies, and in particular, the checkpoint blockade agents. And these have been utterly revolutionary. I want to take you through a couple of cancer medicine, in particular, checkpoint blockade. The next slide, please. So this, this really, this cartoon here and the one after this really summarises our understanding or simplistic understanding of how these checkpoint blockade agents work. And there are two main stages at which you need to consider this. The first one is when a naive T cell is encountering antigen expressed on the surface of an antigen presenting cell. This is this purple hairy thing here for the first time. So in order to get a naive T cell to recognise and become antigen experienced, you need two things. You need a first signal and you need a second signal. Now, the first signal is the interaction between these MHC molecules, this major histocompatibility complex here, which presents small antigens, what we call neoantigens. These are little tiny fragments of mutated uh, or mutant protein that's expressed on the surface of the cancer cells. And it, it basically presents this in association with MHC to the TCR. This is the T cell receptor. This is stage one. In other words, that interaction between MHC peptide uh, complex and the TCR is critically important in the first stage of naive T cell priming. And essentially, these naive T cells come in two main flavors, CD4 cells and CD8 cells. And it's MHC2 presents to CD4 cells and MHC1 presents to CD8 cells. Now, the other thing that's absolutely crucial is the second signal, all right? So you need two signals to properly activate and make antigen experienced a naive T cell. And this second signal 
is the interaction between CD28 expressed on the surface of the T cell and this molecule here, B71 and B72, this is also known as CD80 and CD86. And this interaction is crucially important in terms of making this naive T cell a proper antigen experience T cell that's good to go and can get into the peripheral tissue, the cancer cell tissue, and actually kill the cancer cell, okay? But there's a problem, and that is shown here and in here. Because as CD28 complexes the CD80 and CD86 to drive that signal too, it upregulates on its surface this little molecule here, this yellowish molecule here called CTLA4. And CTLA4 basically blocks the interaction between CD28 and CD80 and CD86 and CD because it competes with CD80 and CD86 on the, uh, for, for binding to C. Uh, Sorry, it competes with CD28 for binding to CD80 and CD86. Indeed, what it does is it actually rips off the molecules of CD80 and CD86 from the surface of the antigen presenting cell. And then you've also got this other cell here, this T regulatory cell, which expresses lots and lots of CTLA4. And again, that blocks that productive interaction between CD80 on the naive T cell and CD80 and CD86 on the antigen presenting cell. So essentially, CTLA4 gets engaged by both T regulatory cells and by activated T cells when they first see antigen. And that CTLA4 blocks that second signal interaction between CD28 and CD80 and CD86, okay? So you've also got, that's checkpoint number one, but you've also got this really crucial checkpoint number two, which occurs at the level of the cancer cell itself. So you can imagine now you've got an antigen experience T cell that's coming into the microenvironment of the cancer to kill the cancer cells. It can recognize antigen and it can also recognize, importantly, antigen expressed on the surface of the cancer cell. So it can destroy it in situ. OK, and again, it recognizes it exactly the same way as with an APC. So in the peripheral tissue where you're trying to get the cancer cell knocked out, these cancer cells can also express MHC on the surface of themselves. So it can express this in situ, okay? But the problem is that as the antigen experience T cell comes into the microenvironment to start to kill that cancer cell, it produces substances. Next slide, please. And these substances include stuff such as interferon gamma. Now, the problem with interferon gamma is it upregulates on the surface of the cancer cell something called PDL1. That's programmed death ligand one. Now, the problem is that activated T cells express on their surface PD1 or programmed death one. So what happens in the cancer microenvironment that as the T cell starts to attack the cancer cell, it causes upregulation of PDL1 on the surface of the cancer cell, which then binds to PD1 on the T cell, and that makes the T cell energic, exhausted, and to die. So you've got these two checkpoints, one at the level of naive T cell priming, where you get upregulation of CTLA4 or CTLA4 expressed on T regulatory cells that blocks the productive second signal from being given to the T cell to activate it. But at the level of the cancer, where you're coming in with your antigen experience T cell to kill the cancer cell, you get upregulation of PDL1 as a direct result of that attack, which then binds to PD1 on the antigen experience T cell and stops it from working. And somebody came up with the million trillion dollar idea a few years ago now, Jim Allison was a particularly important player in this space, of blocking these checkpoints. In other words, to block CTLA4 at the level of naive T cell priming to get more T cells primed. In other words, using an anti-CTLA4 monoclonal antibody. And then again, at the level of the cancer cell, when you've got the antigen experienced T cells in there, to stop them from being made exhausted and energic by the PDL1 PD1 interaction by blocking that interaction, again using monoclonal antibodies, either against PD1 itself, and in this situation we've got drugs like pembrolizumab and nivolumab, they're anti PD1 agents, but also anti PDL1 agents. So typically drugs like atezolizumab and devalumab um, and avelumab. So these have become pivotally important because what they do is allow the patient's own immune system to fight their own cancer. You are activating their own T cells, which can recognize mutated neoantigens, in other words, mutations in the cancer cells that then produce small peptides that can be expressed and therefore the focus of immune attack because they look foreign to the normal proteins. 
And that's precisely what checkpoint blockade is doing. It is enabling and activating T cells in the microenvironment and priming them in the lymph node to then go into the cancer microenvironment and to kill. And they're enabled by that killing by releasing that break at the level of CTLA-4 with anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies or the level of PDL1, PD1 with the use of anti-PD1 or anti-PDL1 antibodies. Next slide, please. And these drugs have been absolutely transformational. I can honestly say the last 10 years has seen a bigger change in the management of lung cancer and melanoma and some other immunogenic cancers, which have got lots of mutations in them, because the more mutations they've got, the more likely you are to present some of these immunogenic neoepitopes that can be seen as formed by the immune system. And we're just going to show you a couple of Kaplan Meyer plots now to really tell you where we've come. You have to remember to put this into context that probably 15 years ago, the five-year survivorship for lung cancer patients was around the 2 to 3% mark. This study is incredibly important, and this is five-year overall survival data we're looking at here. This is the Pivotal Registration Study, Keynote 24. In this study, patients with high levels of PDL1 expression on their cancer cells were randomized to either single-agent anti-PD1 using pembrolizumab, that's in the blue, or chemotherapy. So up until this time, the standard treatment first line was chemotherapy. This is a first line study. Now, why were patients with greater than 50% uh, PDL1 staining uh, randomized in this study? Well, as you might imagine, the more T cells you have in the microenvironment, in other words, the hotter that immune microenvironment is, the more interferon gamma will be produced, and therefore the more PDL1 will be expressed on the more cancer cells. So, very, very high levels of PDL1 in this situation, greater than 50% of all of the cancer cells that staining positive PDL1 means that their approximate T cells are activated and recognizing antigen on the cancer cell surface and therefore producing interferon gamma. So, you've got lots of T cells in there, but they can't work because they're inhibited by PDL1. So these are the patients where theoretically taking that break off at the level of the tumor microenvironment itself, i.e. at the PD1, PDL1 checkpoint, should be maximally effective. And indeed, that's what you find. If you've got a PDL1 negative tumor, no staining at all, that means there's no T cells in there, no T cells producing interferon gamma, and therefore nothing really to activate. You do get some responses, but generally speaking, the responses are low, whereas the PDL1 Positive patients with very high staining levels, these are the ones with lots of T cells ready to go if you can take that break off. And that's precisely what pembrolizumab does. And you can see here, this is the this is actually a little bit earlier than this. This is actually the 24-month uh, overall survival, but we've got median overall survival of 30 months for pembrolizumab and 14.2 months of standard chemotherapy. And look at this, the 24-month goes from overall survival of 35% up to just over 50% for the use of checkpoint blockade. In other words, this is single agent immunotherapy showing clearly that if you can activate a patient's own immune cells, that's doubly more effective than chemotherapy. And what is really important are these five year figures here, because I want you to have as anything the take home message from this, because a five year overall survival in PDL1 high patients greater than 50%, treated with pembrolizumab as a single agent was 31.9%. These are figures that were unheard of. We couldn't even imagine this. And you have to remember, this is the patient's own immune cells that are doing the damage to the cancer. And many patients that get extremely good responses and in a really good response at six months, almost certainly we've cured a number of patients with lung cancer, metastatic disease. I've got patients that I first treated back in 2013, when we first had availability in a phase one trial of pembrolizumab, that were dying of metastatic lung cancer, which was chemo resistant, that are with me now with a normal quality of life and have been on no treatment whatsoever for three or four years with no sign of cancer and no sign of it coming back. Their own immune system, when enabled by checkpoint blockade, destroyed their cancer. Amazing stuff. Next slide, please. This is Keynote 189. So Keynote 189, again, is an absolutely pivotal study. So in patients with greater than 50% staining, we often use single agent pembrolizumab. Okay, it's a standard of care. But actually, a lot of patients we treat with a combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Now, you might say, well, look, if you're trying to get your immune system pepped up with checkpoint blockade, why on earth would you use a chemotherapy agent? Because chemotherapy is immunosuppressive. But actually, chemotherapy's main 
effect is really on neutrophil biology, which has got nothing to do with T cell attack and T cell biology. And in fact, we now know from lots and lots of studies that are done that in fact, chemotherapy can enhance the impact of checkpoint blockade. It does it in a number of different ways. It releases lots of antigens because of course what you're doing is causing apoptosis of cancer cells and antigen release. So that means there's more antigen for take up by antigen presenting cells to present to naive T cells, but also more antigen floating around in the microenvironment generally to be taken up by all antigen presenting cells for the generation of antigen experienced T cells. That's important. Secondly, there's data suggesting that chemotherapy can reduce the level of immunosuppressive cells in the tumor microenvironment, particularly T regulatory cells and particularly myeloid derived suppressor cells. That's important. It also causes quite a lot of inflammation and inflamed tissue is much hotter than is non-inflamed tissue. So the release of danger signals by chemotherapy is important. But probably one of the most important things is, is that quite a lot of these mutated neoantigens are subclonal. In other words, they're not presented on the surface of all cancer cells, just a proportion of them. And what we know is that some chemotherapies can actually upregulate the expression of the granzyme B receptor. Now, granzyme B is a very important molecule that kills cancer cells. So what happens is that you might have, for example, 30% of the cancer cells with that clonal neo or that subclonal neoantigen on it. So in other words, only 30% of the cells can be recognized by antigen experienced T cells that can see that particular antigen on the surface of cancer cells. But with chemotherapy, the granzyme B receptor goes up in all the other 70%. So as it starts to destroy these 30% that express the antigen, it's releasing granzyme B into the uh, surrounding tumor milieu, which can then diffuse into the cells because they've got higher levels of the receptor. So you get bystander killing, and that's probably a very important way in which chemotherapy can aid and abet checkpoint blockade. And this study, again, an absolutely pivotal registration study now, the Keynote 189, basically compared chemotherapy, standard of care first line chemotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer patients, non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer patients with pemetrexid platinum plus or minus pembrolizumab. So the experimental arm were pembrolizumab plus pemetrexid and carboplatin and the control arm was a placebo controlled just chemotherapy alone with pemetrexid and platinum. Can you take us to the next slide, please? So this was directly comparing in the first line setting chemotherapy with chemotherapy and immunotherapy together. And this is the overall survival data here. This is incredibly exciting. So over on the left-hand side at the top, we've got the intention to treat population, the total population. In blue, we've got pembrolizumab plus combined with chemotherapy. We've got chemotherapy alone and placebo below that in the ready color. And if you just concentrate on two figures here, they've got the median overall survival. It more than doubles from 10.7 months with chemo to 22 months with the addition of pembrolizumab with a massive hazard ratio of 0.56 for overall survival. That translates to a 44% reduction in the risk of death at any point during follow-up. And this was seen across all of the TPS, that's tumor proportion score, pdl one positivity, so greater than 50%. Again, we've got this significant improvement in median overall survival and again, an improvement in 24 months, but also seen even in those patients with TPS less than 1%. These are the pdl one negative patients that respond pretty poorly to single agent checkpoint blockade. But you can clearly see here that in the combination of pembrolizumab together with chemotherapy, we're getting a more than doubling of 24 month overall survival, goes from 15% to 38%. Good improvement in the median overall survival and crucially important, a hazard ratio of 0.52. In other words, a reduction in the risk of death of 48%. And this can't possibly be additive because you're getting much more from the combination than you would get if you just took chemotherapy and simply added the effect of immunotherapy in a pdl one negative patient on top of that. So this is synergistic. And indeed, the response rate more than doubles for the addition of checkpoint blockade to chemotherapy. So this has become absolute standard of care. Patients, particularly with pd one negative tumors or TPS, tumor proportion score of one to 49%, they get treated with a combination of chemotherapy with pemetrexid, platinum, normally carboplatin plus pembrolizumab. Uh, these patients have got, as I've already said, non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. Next slide, please. This is the progression-free survival, which again, you can see there's a good parting of the ways in the curves from very early on. So not only overall survival, but progression-free survival is improved. Next slide, please. So Keynote 189 was for patients with 
non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. What about our patients, that 25% of non-small cell lung cancer patients with squamous tumours? So this is the pivotal registration first-line study for these patients. This is Keynote 407, in which squamous lung cancer patients, first line with metastatic disease or locally advanced inoperable disease, were randomised to either receive chemotherapy with paclitaxel this time, uh, plus carboplatin, uh, plus or minus pembrolizumab. In other words, again, in this situation, the control arm was chemotherapy alone with paclitaxel, carboplatin, and the experimental arm was a combination with pembrolizumab. And I mentioned earlier on about this upregulation of the granzyme B receptor. And in fact, it was mainly first described many years ago, actually, serendipitously using paclitaxel. Paclitaxel is quite a potent upregulator of granzyme B and probably one of the ways in which it augments the response that you see with checkpoint blockade. So exactly the same design study. These are the results in the second paragraph here. You can see that there was a significant increase in the median overall survival for the addition of pembrolizumab to paclitaxel carboplatin versus paclitaxel carboplatin alone, going from 11.6 months with chemotherapy to 17.1 months with chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, and with a hazard ratio of 0.71, so a 29% reduction in the risk of death during the follow-up of the study. Somewhat less impressive than you see with the adenocarcinoma or with the non-squamous tumours. Um, certainly the non-squamous 189 data really, really quite compelling. It's somewhat less compelling, I think, with the squamous. And I think this still does represent an area of unmet therapeutic need. And again, you can see a, a significant but relatively modest change in the median progression-free survival. At the end of the day, this still is a move forward over the use of chemotherapy alone. And again, just as we use pemetrexid, carboplatin, pembrolizumab, a standard of care, first-line therapy for our patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. So in the patients are fit enough for it, because this is quite a heavy regimen, actually, we use a combination of paclitax or carboplatin and pembrolizumab for our fit um, advanced disease squamous patients. Last slide on this section, please. And just to show you the Kaplan-Meier plots here, again, you can see uh, two things, really, that clearly there's a parting of the ways in the curve. So pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy in green, the Movi color uh, placebo plus chemotherapy. And you can see that those plots or the plots, they sort of divide very, very early on. Um, so you can see right from the very start of the study, you don't see any deterioration in the use of the additional use of the pembrolizumab. But you can clearly see a parting of the ways early on, which stays apart. So, for example, if you look at the landmark at 12 months here, just below 50%, just under 65% for the combination. And again, this modest but real benefit out at the two-year mark. And again, as I said, with the hazard ratio of 0.71. Next slide, please. So that really summarizes the way in which these drugs work, how they've transformed and revolutionized their management of lung cancer, um, and how we've come to use these as standard treatment. For the situation of high TPS, we use pembrolizumab as a monotherapy quite often. And for those with lower levels of that who are fit enough for it, the combinations of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. But one of the problems that we've had, and it's a problem that we encountered very early on has become a significant healthcare burden, is that just as you're trying to accelerate and improve your anti-cancer immunity so at the same time you can enhance your anti-self immunity in other words start to attack yourself causing autoimmune phenomena the so-called IRAEs or the immune related adverse events and I'm going to pass on to my colleague Akshay Patel who's going to really give you a bit of an overview of immune related adverse event biology and how we might predict it and how potentially we might treat it more effectively so Akshay thanks very much. Thanks, Prof, for that introduction, and thanks for the uh, preceding slides. It was very informative. So as, as Prof's given us a nice overview of to, into checkpoint blockade and how immunotherapy has really revolutionised the landscape of anti-cancer treatment, just as most things in life, immunotherapy isn't quite perfect. So while it's been great at reactivating your T cells to attacking cancer cells, it also attacks host tissue as well. Um, and there are a number of organs that can be attacked by these reactivated, these newly invigorated T cells, particularly the skin, the colon, endocrine organs, liver and lungs. And the two big problems with these autoimmune sequelae are, well, in themselves can be life threatening and contribute significant morbidity, but also invariably very serious grades of immune related adverse events can result in stopping your treatment. Um, so you get discontinuation of the immunotherapy, which means you get progression of the cancer. So it's a huge healthcare burden, but also a socio socioeconomic burden. Next slide, please. 
So this data is taken from the ESMO guidelines. So it's uh, five years old, but it's really very robust and it's incredibly good at giving a nice overview of immune related adverse events. So as you can see, you've got sort of the top left panel looks at the sort of uh, organs that can be affected. You can get endocrine involvement, GI involvement, hepatotoxic involvement. And, and, the, and the key really, if you look at the bottom, is if you look at the, the X axis in the bottom right panel, you can see the X axis goes from zero to 14 weeks. And the onset of immunotherapy related adverse events can, is, it can be very insidious or, and, and it can also be very, very acute. So it's incredibly variable at what, at what time it can, it can start. Um, and the incidence of it is incredibly variable as well. Next slide, please. So the CTCAE criteria are essentially a grading criteria on how severe these uh, adverse events can be. Grade one and two invariably are not uh, overtly serious. They don't invariably require you to start further treatment, but the really high grade toxicity, the grade threes, the grade fours, are quite serious and significant. They can invariably lead to stopping of your immunotherapy and as well as requirement of uh, further treatment in the form of IV um, uh, glucocorticoid therapy um, and, uh, and, uh, and otherwise as well. Next slide, please. So a large part of the work that we've done over the last few years was really to look at the focus um, of these these toxic sequelae on patients getting checkpoint blockade in lung cancer and to really determine the immunobiological basis for it with a focus on B cells. We know that T cells are hugely implicated in determining responses within the tumor microenvironment to cancer progression, response to treatment. But B cells are really, you know, have really only come onto the scene, I would say, probably in the last five years and particularly within the last two years in a much bigger way. So the sort of, I think I would describe the turning point um, for B cell involvement um, came sort of at the beginning of 2020 when there were three big papers published looking at the role of B cells in determining outcome to checkpoint blockade, not only in small cell lung cancer, but also in melanoma and other cancers like sarcoma. Now, sarcoma invariably has been shown to be incredibly resistant to things like chemotherapy, but to immunotherapy has can respond very well with your B cell repertoire being incredibly influential in determining outcome. Now, from a toxicity point of view, there's only one real paper that was sort of published at the back end of 2018 that looked at B cells and toxicity on checkpoint blockade and that was in melanoma and that really showed sort of um, a relationship between CD21 low cells um, and patients who got toxicity. However, it didn't really provide any mechanism or any sort of in-depth understanding of the biology of what B cells are doing in this disease. So that was really our rationale for looking at B cells with a focus on toxicity. Next slide please. So we took a cohort of patients, stage 3B or higher, so advanced non-small cell lung cancer we're talking. It was a mixture of adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas, so about a 50-50 split. And these patients were all treated with a combination of anti-PD-1 therapy or anti-PD-1 therapy uh, with chemotherapy. Now, we had 46 patients in our cohort, and what we did is we took blood from all these patients um, pre-treatment, so pre-first cycle of immunotherapy, so they're all treatment naive, and we essentially eluted off all their B-cells and used mass cytometry to essentially deep phenotype the circulating B cell repertoire in these patients. Now, mass cytometry is essentially a phenotyping method, but it's like it's like flow cytometry, but it's, but it's much more detailed. You can use 38 markers, sometimes up to 40 markers on one single panel to really profile a specific cellular population um, within a patient's blood or whatever tissue you're looking at. And we looked at this with a view to stratifying it and correlating it to patients' outcome with respect to checkpoint blockade. We looked at healthy control tissue as well. So next slide, please. So in these patients, there's 46 patients that we had, we had eight of them experienced very severe toxicity. And this toxicity was grade three or higher as defined by the CTCAE criteria that I showed you earlier. Now, three of these patients um, received pembrolizumab in combination with chemotherapy and five of them received pembrolizumab as a monotherapy. Now, Colitis, pneumonitis, and myelopathy and severe nephritis were the real bulk of these toxicities that we saw. And you can see on sort of point three, the median time to severe toxicity was 42 and a half days, so just over a month, um, with some patients stretching out to sort of 115 days, which was almost three months before the onset of colitis. That's after four or five cycles of, chemothera of um, immunotherapy. Every patient who suffered these high grade toxicities had to discontinue their immunotherapy and had to start sort of further treatments in order to prevent them from you know progressing from their toxicity. Next slide please. So so this slide is something that we call a UMAP. A UMAP is a way of visualizing 
B cell phenotypes or any cellular phenotypes on a 2D scale. It's a dimensionality reduction method and essentially what it shows is the circulating B cells that we've looked at in the patients um, before they started checkpoint blockade. Now you have stratified these three UMAPs according to their clinical outcome. You've got patients who had no toxicity on the left, the, the eight patients who suffered very high grade toxicity in the middle and on the right you've got the healthy controls. Now the two things to know about a UMAP are different colours represent different phenotypes of B cells and spacing between the different islands on each UMAP indicates phenotypic differences. So they, so for example, the ones in the highlighted by the blue boxes are phenotypically different from the main bulk in the middle. Now let's focus on the three that I've highlighted in the blue boxes. Now if you focus on these three and no toxicity patients, you've got quite a reasonable representation of these three particular clusters. But if you look in the toxicity cohort, these are attenuated in that, in that I mean the colours of them are slightly visually reduced, particularly if you look at box C, which is the bottom, uh, and that's represented by the pink and light green cluster. There's very little of it in the toxicity cohort, and similarly so in the control cohorts. So this was what we found quite interesting. Visually speaking, this was the most striking difference we saw in the circulating B-cell repertoire of non-small cell lung cancer patients with respect to outcome, so those who got no toxicity and those who got toxicity. So we drilled deeper into the phenotypes of these cells and we discovered something further. Next slide, please. So now this is the same UMAP, but instead of looking at lots of different colours, this UMAP is purely predicated on IL-10 expression. IL-10 is a cytokine released by numerous cell types, but in particular B cells, and it is a immunosuppressive cytokine. So the primary role of IL-10 is to suppress inflammation. And B cells that produce IL-10 invariably are known as B regulatory cells. Now B regulatory cells have been described in the literature for many years now. They're a cellular, they're, they're sort of the, I would call them the B cell counterpart to Tregs or T regulatory cells. They are both immunosuppressive. But B regulatory cells are induced by um, the, by, by the body in response to a particular inflammatory stimulus. So where you have areas of high inflammation, you get induction of Bregs to produce lots of IL-10 and then dampen down the inflammation. Now looking at the IL-10 expression, you can see that those three boxes that I highlighted earlier, we looked into them particularly and they were the only three sort of clusters that were very high producers of IL-10 as indicated by the red arrows and the very the high areas of yellow and green. Lots of yellow and green mean, means high IL-10 production. Now, those same three clusters exist in the toxicity cohort, but if you look in the toxicity UMAP, you can see there's very little yellow or very little green in those complementary clusters, meaning that even though those particular B cells are still represented in the circulation of toxicity patients, they are not producing IL-10, meaning that they are functionally not suppressive. Next slide, please. Now, this is a diffusion map, and it's essentially the same population of circulating B cells in the same three cohorts, but just represented in a different way. And a diffusion map, the sort of beauty of a diffusion map is that it essentially displays cells along their axes of differentiation. So if you look at these three boxes that I've highlighted in blue, they are the same three boxes that I showed on the U map, but now on a diffusion map. So looking in the sort of zero, zero position, i.e. the bottom left corner, you can see that you get differentiation along two particular axes, one going very north, represented by A, and one going far easterly, represented by box C. Now, in the diffusion map, similarly in the toxicity patients, you see that there's no representation of cluster A, meaning that they don't have any of those B cells in the toxicity patients. And similarly, the, the clusters represent the B cells which are re represented by cluster C are also um, attenuated in the toxicity cohort. Next slide, please. We also looked at a separate cohort completely externally and found essentially the same message. So if you look at the left hand UMAP, you can see non-toxicity patients, you've got representation of the B cell clusters highlighted by the blue boxes and they are devoid or attenuated in the toxicity cohort. Again, when you stratify that according to IL-10 expression, you can see that there's lots of IL-10 as indicated by lots of the yellow and lots of the green in that cluster in the, in the no toxicity patients, but in the toxicity cohort, that production of yellow and green is devoid. So what we have seen here is that in patients who suffer high grade immune related adverse events on checkpoint blockade, they have a deficiency or 
um, an attenuation in the circulating B cell repertoire specific for IL-10. So what we're thinking is the patients who suffer toxicity lack this suppressive B cell um, signature that allows them to dampen down inflammation. Next slide, please. And when we looked at those particular clusters in detail, we found that they mapped almost exactly to phenotypes that have been described in the literature already that map to regu known B regulatory phenotypes seen in various conditions, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer, and where Bregs really came to limelight was in autoimmune disease, so SLE, collagen vascular disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and murine models of these patients and of these disease processes showed that these Bregs that were described previously in the literature in murine models and in human ex vivo and in vivo studies were the same B regulatory phenotypes that we were seeing in these lung cancer patients. They were the same B regulatory phenotypes that were attenuated in patients with toxicity, and those B regulatory phenotypes were not able to functionally produce IL-10 based on this single cell phenotyping data. So what did we do next? Next slide, please. So we looked at the significance of the differences in these B regulatory phenotypes. Now, if you look at this, this is a differential abundance map. And essentially what this does is it applies a generalized linear mixed model, which is a robust statistical regression model to determine if the differences we've seen between toxicity and no toxicity with respect to these B regulatory phenotypes is significant or not. You can see in the right hand sort of um, Y axis, you've got lots of red and green bars and then you've got these dark gray bars. Now, the top five rows are represented by these dark gray bars that indicates statistical significance and the numbers alongside indicates the P value. So starting at the top, you've got a P value of 0 0.01 moving all the way down to 0 0.04, indicating that that clusters 2, 9, 12, 15 and 18, as shown by the left Y axis column, were significantly different between tox and no tox. And as it happens, 2, 9, 12, 15 and 18 were also those five B reg phenotypes that we saw that were visually attenuated on the UMAP and the diffusion map. The two points I would really like to hammer home about the differential abundance map is that firstly, it's completely unsupervised. So it's a unsupervised regression model that picks out the key differences and applies robust statistical analysis to it with multiple correction testing. And the second thing to say is when you deal with patient cohorts less than 30, so our patient cohort was, was 46, you have to make sure you account for patient to patient variability, i.e. a single patient that has an anomaly is that that doesn't go towards the significance testing. So patient to patient variability was treated as a random effect, which is important. So taking that into account as a random effect means that the differences we we're seeing here were statistically significant and robust. Next slide, please. So we then took the same B cells from the same patients and put them into functional B cell assays where we essentially eluted off their B cells and cultured them with CPG and IL-2. Now the CPG IL-2 co-culture enabled them to be converted into the BREG phenotype. We then stimulated the cells for 40 hours with PMA, ionomycin, profeldin and monensin to enable them to produce the maximum amount of cytokines as possible and then compared the cytokine signature in these patients functionally to toxicity and between toxicity and no toxicity patients. Now this plot looks at IL-10 production ex vivo purely from B cells that have been whipped into the BREG phenotype in these patients. You can see that the no toxicity patients indicated by this green box plot on the right produce reasonable amounts of IL-10. The control patients, as you would expect, also produce reasonable amounts of IL-10. But the toxicity patients produce very little IL-10. And the significance between toxicity and no toxicity was 5.2 times 10 to the minus 8, which is hugely significant. The Kruskal Wallace, which looked at the overall difference between all three cohorts, also incredibly significant. Next slide, please. So we then took the same B cells that we whipped into the BREG phenotype that were incredibly suppressive, high producers of IL-10 and co-cultured them with autologous CD4 T cells. Now autologous CD4 T cells are very good at producing interferon gamma, but when you co-culture them with B cells, particularly B cells that have been whipped into the suppressive B regulatory phenotype, they suppress the amount of autologous interferon gamma production by these T cells. So focusing on the left-hand panel, the control set of patients, you can see in the x-axis produced by the red box plot in the control patients is autologous CD4 derived interferon gamma, and you can see it's quite high. When you start to co-culture these cells with um, 
B regulatory cells in a one to one fashion, you get a de decrease in interferon gamma production, which is what you would expect. The interferon gamma production is being suppressed by these B cells, and this happens in a stepwise fashion. It's dose dependent as you move from one to one to one to two to one to four co culture with B regs. So you get this nice dose dependent, dependent suppression of interferon gamma in control patients, which is what you would expect. Similarly, in no toxicity patients, you get the same dose dependent suppression. So the B regs produced by patients who did not experience toxicity were functionally intact. They were able to press interferon gamma effectively, and that was all significant. Now, in the toxicity patients, you can see the same trend um, based on the median amount of interferon gamma production. However, this was not to be deemed significant. So biologically, the suppressive effect of these B cells on autologous CD4 interferon gamma production was not significant. Next slide, please. OK, so what did we surmise out of all of this? So we've essentially seen B regulatory phenotypes in these patients that can be PD1 positive, PDL1 positive, or produce cytokines like IL10, IL35, and TGF beta, which is one of the main suppressive mechanisms of these cells. We felt that production of these cytokines by B regulatory phenotypes suppressed flux from the CD4 to the T follicular help cell pathway, which was then preventing germinal center activation and production of autoantibody. But these B, regs, B regulatory cells could act independently of IL-10, IL-35, and TGF-beta. They could either be PDL1 positive and interact directly with CD4 T cells causing suppression, or they could produce PD1 and interact with tumor microenvironment specific PDL1 to produce further suppressive cytokines and suppress anti tumor immunity. So, this is how it all sort of ties together. We published this work in Nature Communications earlier this year. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to introduce a little bit more information about toxicity antibodies and what the mechanisms are and biologically what we think is going on. So toxicity originally was thought to be T cell dependent destruction of host immune cells and host and uh, by host immune cells of host tissue. And yes, while that is true, there is also reason to believe and also good evidence in murine data and ex vivo data suggests that it's also antibody, auto antibody driven. And as we've seen from that schematic we just displayed, it can be both. So this data comes from Yoshinori's group um, in Science Translational Medicine um, from last year, and it shows that administering anti um, PD-1 antibody introduces destructive thyroiditis in mice immunized with thyroglobulin. So you give loads of monoclonal antibody to PD-1 to these mice and induces severe destruction of thyroid tissue, which is auto antibody mediated. Next slide, please. Similarly, in patients who had melanoma, who got severe toxicity when treated with a checkpoint blockade showed that the baseline levels of autoantibody was significantly increased in those patients who incurred toxicity and more so increased if you synergistically treated them with anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at these four box plots, you can see in patients who got hypophysitis and pneumonitis, the amount of autoantibody in circulation was significantly increased compared to those patients who did not get hypophysitis and pneumonitis, suggesting a T cell independent mechanism. Now, the T cells could still be offering germinal center help to these B cells, um, getting germinal center help, which results in autoantibody production, but they could also be acting in a purely T cell independent fashion and auto completely autoantibody mediated. Next slide, please. So why do I bring that up? Because a lot of the work that we've done in the immunotherapy space with looking at B cells is really focused on the B cell biological mechanism. These lack of suppressive B cells are stopping T cell destruction of host cells. It's also stopping T cell help, which, is, which then stops flux through the germinal center. Now, we've done a lot of autoantibody work already in early stage lung cancer, which we've done with Syngenix, and Professor Middleton alluded to that earlier. We've shown that there are biomarkers that are autoantibody circulating signatures that can be predictive of outcome postoperatively in early stage lung cancer, i.e. they are prognostic biomarkers. Now, we know in toxicity there are there is work being done that is yet unpublished, but we can there is a, a theory that there is a circulating autoantibody signature that could well be polyepitopic in nature, that could be a robust biomarker for toxicity post checkpoint blockade. Now, if we looked in early stage patients, we took serum from lots of early stage patients with stage one lung cancer, and we looked to see if there was any circulating autoantibody signatures that could be predictive outcome postoperatively. We used an unsupervised iterative machine learning algorithm where we took almost 1600 biomarkers based on the immune array and we applied recursive feature elimination, followed by a series of stepwise logistic regression and um, um, 
multi-inference approaches to determine the most parsimonious model that could be predictive of these patients. We identified a 13 signature panel. And if you look at this rock score, this rock curve in the middle, you can see that we tested this panel in two separate cohorts, in cohort one and cohort two. Cohort two is identified by the green line and cohort one by the blue line. And you can see the area on the curve for both was in excess of 0 0.08. So the predictivity of this biomarker panel is incredibly powerful. We showed that by creating an aggregate score, we identified patients who are high expressors of this biomarker panel, their five-year survival post-operatively for early stage resected lung cancer was 7.6%, which is incredibly low compared to those who are low expressors of this panel was 88.5%, which is huge. So the biology of this panel could have been was, was significantly influential to this cohort of patients. And we can see on multivariate Cox proportional hazard modeling that the hazard ratio of patients who are high expressors of panel A had a hazard ratio of 19.6, which is massive with a p-value of 0 0.001. And that is also with respect to um, stage. So we've seen we can utilize biomarker and also antibody discovery in early stage lung cancer, and it could well be the next step to be to discovery in advanced stage lung cancer, toxicity, response and also antibodies um, in advanced stage lung cancer, but we'll have to watch this space. Thank you for that very informative presentation, Akshay and Gary. It's now time for our question and answer session. So if you've got any further questions, please do send those in now. You can submit these by typing into the questions box to the right of your screen. So the first question we have is, what are the future applications of B cell biology in checkpoint blockade? So, so that's a good question. Um, I suppose the obvious way to go is to really build on the work that we've already done, looking at the relationship between suppressive B cell phenotypes and outcome with respect to toxicity. So we've already determined that there are certain circulating B cells that have a relationship to toxicity in patients and really translating that into a clinically viable and applicable biomarker to determine which patients are the highest risk of toxicity is the first way to go. So the data we showed earlier was really looking mass cytometry, functional ex vivo assays, really quite complicated experimental techniques which aren't readily translatable into the clinical arena purely because of time and B cost. But if we can determine a sort of easy to use flow cytometry based biomarker, that would be fundamentally important in the next few years, particularly with respect to treatment paradigms that are continually evolving. We have looked at a lot of work with respect to IL-10 and TNF-alpha purely in the serum, and that's been a validated signature in renal cell in patients who are receiving renal transplants and looking at T cell mediated rejection. And a lot of that work that we've also applied to our data has been shown to be hugely predictive, and that's something we're exploring. I suppose delving more into the biology of B cells, I think really understanding the drivers and the mechanisms that induce these B regs in vivo. And there's a lot of work to suggest that the microbiome could be influential. And I think that's one way to look. I think if we can understand what drives these B cells, we can readily turn on particular suppressive B cells at a time that's convenient to patients, i.e. stopping toxicity, and turn them off in patients who are very prone to recurrence and relapse, where you don't want these suppressive things damping down your anti-cancer effective T cell responses. And finally, I think looking at clonality really to determine are these B cell populations that are generated in response to cancer and in res response to treatment, are they clonal, are they subclonal? What are the tumor associated antigens that are driving them? And I think that probably is going to be the biggest arena where there could be the hugest potential impact purely because if we can find particular antigens that are grossly immunogenic for these effector B cell populations and these suppressor B cell populations, there could be scope to develop vaccines that can generate these B cell humoral responses in vivo without the need for adoptive transfer. And we've seen from work in COVID, from mRNA vaccines, from Pfizer BioNTech and melanoma that's already been done with lipomeric. I think that's going to be the next big space in B cell biology and lung cancer and solid cancers, but we're a way away from that yet. But hopefully we'll know more in the next few years. That's perfect, thank you. The next question is, how will IO evolve in the next five to 10 years? Well, it's been an amazing 10 years really, and uh, the, the sort of pace of change has been enormous. And so for once in my life, I think I can honestly say, I'm not exactly sure what it might look like in 10 years time, let alone in five years, it's just so rapidly progressing. I think the main change is going to come in the early disease setting, and it, it really is happening now. So at the moment, we think very much about immunotherapy in terms of treating advanced disease, patients with metastatic disease. And as I say, it's been transformational for certain diseases. But I think where there's some real, real interest in is in the preoperative neoadjuvant setting and the postoperative adjuvant setting. And they're two 
distinct ways of looking at this. So certainly immunotherapy with checkpoint blockade has been very, very interesting in certain cancers. I think probably the one that the most excitement has been is in microsatellite unstable colorectal cancer, both colon and rectum cancer, with the data from the Stalimab, um, from GSK in rectal cancer, and more, uh, and again, at around the same time, the niche data from Miriam Chalabi in colonic cancer, microsatellite instability. This is a disease with lots and lots of frame shift mutations, so it's very highly immunogenic. And the results are quite astonishing. Um, so that in the setting of colon cancer, for example, in niche, uh, where 100 patients were treated, um, the vast majority of these had major pathological responses. In other words, the whole of the cancer had died with the exception of 10%. And a large number of these patients had pathological complete response, just two cycles of immunotherapy preoperatively, no cancer cells left at all. And we're moving very much now into field of organ preservation, particularly useful in rectal cancer, MSS, uh, MSI tumours rather, but also in other diseases like melanoma, where they are using a couple of cycles of checkpoint blockade is normally combined treatment with nivolumab and ipilimumab, so anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4, to actually then take out the largest lymph gland in patients to see if they've had a really good pathological response where they can be completely spared having any further nodal surgery, which can be quite damaging to them, of course. So in other words, reduction in the amount of surgery needed to be done, complete organ preservation, and again, great outcomes, because we know that these patients have really good responses to preoperative checkpoint blockade, whether it's being lung cancer with chemotherapy, immunotherapy combined, or combination immunotherapy in melanoma, or combination immunotherapy in microsatellite unstable colorectal cancer. These patients have fantastic event-free survivals with a very good marker for very good outcome. And bear in mind that quite a few of these patients, particularly the MSI colorectal patients, they don't have any further treatment at all. Just two cycles of immunotherapy, that's your treatment done. That's pretty revolutionary. The other interesting place is in the adjuvant setting. And here we can think about a really precision medicine approach. Um, and I think some of the most exciting trials that are going on, and, and actually it's already mentioned the BioNTech venture, but there's some very, very interesting studies going on in that particular space. So what you can do with this is you can actually have a, a precision vaccine, a personalized vaccine of your own neoantigens. In other words, they've got a really good pipeline for the construction of mRNA vaccines. They sequence the patient's tumours, have a very good prediction algorithm for saying what the mutated neoantigens are that can be presented on HLA molecules, which are HLA typed for that patient. And then they can produce a vaccine which encodes the RNA for a number of these different antigens, put it into a lipoplex formulation, squirt it in intravenously, it goes to the spleen particularly, and then activates lots and lots and lots of antigen presenting cells that are then presenting these antigens. And what you can do is finesse that by actually not only having a bespoke vaccine, but a bespoke biomarker to tell you when to give it. In other words, circulating tumor DNA, which matches up with the primers, that, uh, the primers match up to the vaccine. So in other words, not only can you get the primers that you can use in a ctDNA, bespoke, individualized, personalized uh, biomarker for relapse. In other words, looking for minimal residual disease after surgery to then come in with the personalized vaccine encoding those particular antigens you're seeing coming on in the blood. Very, very elegant. Very nice data that they presented at ASCO this year where they took patients with pancreatic cancer that had been resected, did exactly this, made a personalized vaccine, gave them the vaccine together with adjuvant volferinox treatment and a shot of atezolizumab to overcome the PD-1, pd one problem that you get with any antigen uh, T cell, whether it be vaccine produced or not, and essentially showed that about half had an immune response in the blood. In other words, new TCRs coming on, significantly showing a de novo immune response generated by the vaccine. None of those patients with a response relapsed. All of the patients without a response relapsed. Amazing stuff. And they're taking this now into the sort of phase three setting. They're also doing a colorectal cancer study as well. And then finally, cell therapy. It's been knocking on the door in solid cancers. Obviously, there's a huge amount of excitement, particularly CD19 CAR-Ts and some of the other CAR-Ts in the hematological malignancies. But I think we will see a real change in this coming very soon. Um, not only sort of personalized uh, clonal neoantigen T cells are sort of things that are being done by Achilles, for example, but I think that engineered autologous T cells are going to become important off the shelf um, T cell products. And in particular, Steve Rosenberg's been popularizing this recently. He's been looking at uh, TCRs that basically can recognize mu common mutated antigens like RAS. So lots and lots of patients with cancer have RAS mutations. 
And she's worked out TCR clonotypes that would actually be suitable for about a third of patients with RAS mutation. So a really high number. Then you take the patient's own T cells, you engineer the TCR that will recognize their particular RAS mutation and squirt them back in again. An off the shelf mutation specific oncogenic driver um, T cell product. So engineered T TCR, engineered T cells, I think are going to be really interesting. And then finally, we talk a lot about alpha beta T cells, but the other important cell populations which are not particularly restricted by MHC at all, like the gamma delta cells and NK cells, again, that's going to be important. And I've got a feeling that gamma delta cells over the next five, 10 years could be very, very important. That's perfect. Thank you. The next question we've got is what is the relationship with response to checkpoint blockade? Ted. Yeah, so we really looked at respo response to check blockade in the point of toxicity. And we found that if you have a suppressive B cell signature, you're almost protected against toxicity because you have the suppression of your sort of autoreactive T cells. By that logic, you would expect patients who've got lots of suppressive B cells also have suppression of the anti sort of cancer effector T cell responses and vice versa. Now, we didn't quite see that biologically, but when we drill deeper into the sort of cytokine ex vivo analysis of these patients and of their cellular phenotypes, we found that these patients were not only functionally defective in IL-10 production, but also they were they sort of were polyfunctionally devoid of lots of cytokines. So their ability to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha and IL-17 was also suppressed. So these B cells that you're sort of whipping out of these patients who get high grade toxicity, not only are they not suppressive, but they're also not very pro-inflammatory. So it muddied the water slightly. So it made us think, is are these B cells sort of at a particular stage in their development where they have a sort of in, innate predisposition to produce cytokines on that lower level? And then you get a second signal from the cancer or from the circulation that then completely switches off all functionality. So that's the reason we didn't see any biological reciprocity between toxicity and response. And, and I think biologically, that's what you'd want. I mean, clinically, that's certainly what you would want. You wouldn't want patients who don't get any toxicity to then relapse from disease at six months and not and get completely um, no response whatsoever to immunotherapy. That's not what you want at all. You want to be able to turn on these effective responses whilst minimising the amount of checkpoint um, toxicity. So it was an interesting phenomenon. And what we've seen in very historical data from Ligon's group showed that actually the amount of cytokine that's produced in health, ex vivo and in vivo, is actually on a spectrum. It's incredibly heterogeneous. So you can take 100 patients who are completely healthy and whip out all their B cells. Now, their B cells can produce IL-10 on a spectrum of sort of 5 to 100 nanograms per mil. It's incredibly heterogeneous. And the same thing applies to interferon gamma, to TNF-alpha, to IL-6 and IL-17. So the supposition is that in patients who don't get any sort of functionality across the spectrum, across the board of all cytokines, could these be patients that have an innate disposition to produce lower levels, lower levels of cytokine that is then completely switched off by an exogenous signal, or by, or sorry, by an endogenous signal rather that comes from um, a tumour source, is it a TME source that's switching off? And that goes back to my first response to your first question. We need to really delve deeper into the drivers of B cell induction, not just Breg induction, but B cell induction what drives the functionality of B cells at the level of the tumor microenvironment, because that will shed a lot more light on what is going on with these patients, how we can manipulate the B cells such that we promote the B cell phenotypes that are effector, that are anti-cancer, and we switch off the phenotypes that are suppressive and, and pro-cancer, and, and, and but whilst bearing in mind the importance of toxicity. So I realize I've probably not really given you a finite answer because there really isn't a finite answer. I think the more we discover, the more we find out that we don't know, um, which is one of these things with science. But um, I'm hoping, you know, the more we delve into the drivers of induction, the more we'll find out about how it actually relates to response. But it's certainly not reciprocal. It is completely not one to one. It's, it's very, very sort of collinear, cross linear, whatever you like. It's the, there's no one to one ratio. Thank you. And on to the next question. This one is, what are the next steps for the prognostic signatures that you discovered in NSCLC lung resection patients? OK, thanks very much for that. Um, yes, very good question. Uh, we, we're quite excited about this signature um, in, in two respects. We feel that um, because of the nature of some of the proteins that are seen, particularly the cancer testes antigens that are seen within the signature, that actually 
you could take patients with very high levels of the signature that can do really badly and actually vaccinate them with with these cancer test use antigens. So again, not only a sort of predictive or prognostic biomarker, but perhaps something telling us that there is something we should perhaps be vaccinating against because the implication is that that their their cells are see their immune cells are seeing these antigens and therefore you know producing autoantibodies against them. So that's one possibility. But I think importantly, when you do a study, you always need to validate that data. Okay, now we did split our data, um, test and validation, but that's not quite the same as taking somebody else's, you know, blood, tissue, plasma, whatever it is that you're doing, and then asking that same question of that. And you saw that with our CITOF data, uh, with our B cell data, we had a separate external validation set from King's. And that, that impresses people. You know, if you can say, we found it in one data set, in one place, in one space, in one trial, and then we found it in completely another one and found exactly the same thing. That's really much more robust and strong. And so I'm very pleased indeed to say that Syngenics have agreed to fund um, the validation test. And we're getting um, samples from the Tracer X study. Tracer X study is a, a fundamentally important study looking at the um, intratumoral heterogeneity and its impact on the biology of lung cancer led by Charlie Swanton. There's uh, seen some fantastic stuff. And we've got a really, again, well dichotomized set of patients doing badly, patients doing well, who have had surgery. And we're going to use those samples to run through the Syngenics platform as an independent validation set. And if we do validate that, which I think we will, because, you know, the data was very strong, I think we will be onto something very important. And I think Syngenics will be onto something very important as well. Well, that's all we've got time for today. So I'd like to thank our experts for presenting with us today and for that informative presentation and discussion. And a big thank you to everyone joining us online. We hope you found this a worthwhile session. If you've got any further questions, please feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net and I will follow up with your questions. Remember, you can download related resources in the tab to the left of your screen, and this includes the certificates of attendance. If you'd like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in just a few days time. Goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.